All right, welcome to the Curious Builder Podcast. I'm Mark Williams, your host. Today, we're joined with Chris Anderson from Month End. Welcome, Chris. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on the, the podcast. I've heard a lot of good things about it. Oh, it's been uh, it's been a wild ride here in the last uh, five, six months. And uh, we met just recently through a friend of ours. They were just on the podcast, Rick Kendall. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and how it pertains to building, and then we'll kind of dive into that. Month End is bookkeeping for builders. Uh, there's not a lot of people out there that understand construction. There's not a lot of people that understand construction accounting. Two different things. One's building a house, one's building financial statements. <laughs> <laughs> and there's not a lot of folks in either of those communities that understand software. So our company is sort of in the middle of those three things. And we've played in all of those spaces and allows us to be able to provide good services and advice to builders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're right now in the onboarding uh, process uh, of switching over, and we can talk about that a little bit later. I've been really impressed at kind of your breadth of knowledge. Um, and what I want to go back is kind of the origin story of Month End. How long has it been around? And we'll kind of dive into the specifics. I think a lot of people listening, obviously, are, are, as this is a builder-centric show, and we're interviewing mostly Minnesota builders and architects, and you know, people listening are in the trades. Um, I think this pertains to them. We've grown up understanding and, and seeing all these different invoices. I'd love to hear from your <laughs> point of view is like accounting and building seems to be sort of a nightmare hot mess. Is it just because it's that hard or is it because builders in general are just not good at it? How, how can you relate building finances and accounting versus let's say other businesses and other industries? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Builders and accountants are both really late to adopt technology. Uh, both industries are really slow to adopting things. Accounting is a very standardized industry. Uh, home building, there's no standards, right? <laughs> you have building codes that dictate how a house should be built, but business practices, best practices, you don't really have standards. The NAHB has tried to provide some things. Um, but a lot of builders, you know, they come from trades and they become builders and running a business is secondary to building a home to them. So you get a big variety of skills and education and know-how about business. And all of that collides and becomes an environment that's challenging for people trying to keep track of things. Interesting. I think that's, wow, that's very succinct. I think you've had a practice saying that before. Someone once wise told me that uh, when I was starting building, they said, you could be a good builder and bad at business and you won't make it. You could be good at business and a bad builder and you could make it. Obviously, you hope to be good at business and a good builder, but I think his point was under my, or just pointed out with what you just said that ultimately running a good business is a kind of a separate skill. You just happen to be a business that is also a builder. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and we see that with some of our clients. Some of our best builders, who have the most success financially, come from non-traditional building backgrounds. So. We have people who have studied like theater at NYU who said, really? who That's said, like, you know, I want to be a builder for whatever reason. They were inspired to be a builder and they have great home building companies. And we have people who grew up being framers, trim carpenters, and their home building companies are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's very honest and very, uh, I can see that. Interesting. I love the theater thing. That, that thing. That's a wild ride. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's f- people that come from finance. There's a fair amount of builders that come from finance. And there's, I think, some reasons for that. Um, but, From what I understand, that's stupid. Then they don't know much about finance. Because as I've talked to other business <laughs> owners, the margins that we make in building, like, is nothing compared to what it feels like for the risk tolerances that we take. I mean, we're on the hook in Minnesota for ten years. Um, uh, even talking to other builders around the country, our percentage margins are way less than they are in other parts of the country. And for sure, if you consider, you know, making a widget or making other things or services, our percentages are are very low. I mean, would you? I mean, you just get to see all the inside financials. What is your What's your take on that compared to, let's say, other industries? Yeah. So home building in general, it's hard to make money. Yep. Um, and the reason the margins suffer in a place like the Twin Cities, we can get into the politics behind that. A lot of it is because of the challenging building codes we have here. It's a challenging environment. We have a lot of money here in the Twin Cities. There's a lot of people that want to spend money on on stuff, right? They want to build beautiful houses. But we also have a more conservative culture where having a beautiful house or a beautiful car isn't as important to them. So, you know, that kind of squeezes the margins. There's plenty of competition here. Land's not cheap. So it's it's a little tougher to squeeze it out. Although there's there's some builders who do really well. Um, Usually it's builders who either have the ability to build at scale. Look at the top 25 builder list in Minnesota and you take the top 10 of them, they're building at scale. 
And that's really what's contributing to their ability to make margin. And then you have people like Rick and Amy Hen- Hendel, who undoubtedly do a great job making margin because they have a differentiated product. Mm-hmm. They have a product that's special and unique, and not anybody can do it. So if you're p- playing in Rick and Amy's space or you're playing in you know, Lennar's space, you have the best chance at making the best of your financial situation at home building. Interesting. So the, the it's the upper and the lower. It's a little bit like buying a truck, don't they say? Like either buy the most expensive truck or the least expensive truck. It's the <laughs> trucks in the middle when you go to resell it that you get hammered on? I don't know anything about that, but generally <laughs> in business, and I think when you're selling a service or a product, if you can be the low cost provider, mm-hmm. so the scale, the Lennar, or you have something special where you can charge a premium for it compared to how much you paid or how much cost is associated with that thing, mm-hmm. you're going to do well. Have you ever heard of that company, uh, Mark D. Williams Custom Homes? Oh, they sound familiar. Yeah, I think they're on the lower end. I think they're more like a Lennar builder. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, everyone likes to make fun of themselves. Um, going back, uh, actually, that's since you are a unique perspective to answer this, because you could give me some broad percentages for those listening. You know, usually if a builder comes on the show, I'm not going to act ask them directly. You know, what they make. You know, for a GC markup or mm-hmm. how much do they charge for the PM? Because obviously, most of the builders I'm interviewing are in Minnesota, so they might run into their competition. But because you uh, basically work for people all over the country, yeah. I think you might be in a unique position to answer some of these questions, and it's not specific to anybody. Um, uh, Let's let's call it uh, the average GC markup for a cost plus home. What do you in a, let's call it uh, a two a million and a half to two billion above. So let's call it a high end home. What are you seeing for new construction percentage markups in a cost plus setting across it's re- the country? Yeah, it's really tricky. There's a lot of things that go into it, and there's a lot of ways that builders represent markup. Sometimes their markup is small, and they have a lot of additional fees. Yep, and it's a marketing thing. It's just, optics, just like the airlines. Right? Delta, you just pay one price and that's what it is, it, especially if you have a SkyMiles card. It, it's your luggage, it's whatever it is. If you fly on JetBlue, I would know. Because <laughs> <laughs> you flew up to Vegas on JetBlue? I, I didn't. You know, I went a couple days early so I could make sure I didn't. But you know, I, I mean, if you love JetBlue, sorry, whatever. I've never flown on JetBlue. I'm sure it's perfectly fine. The point is, <laughs> from what I understand, your price isn't your price. You pay 200 for the flight, baggage fees, whatever else, you're paying 350 So some builders <clears throat> incorporate that same sort of, um, let's call it marketing approach. Yes. Because it really is a marketing approach. You can say, I'm a cost plus builder and I charge 15% and that's all in. All right. Well, your margins are going to be a little bit thin at the end of the day when you take everything off the bottom line. Yep. Some builders charge 10%, but they charge a supervision fee. They charge a technology fee. They charge a software fee. They charge for fuel. They charge for everything. So at the end of the day, their gross margin, which is what really matters, is fantastic. It's a very uh, lucrative way to do it for them. So that, I might interrupt you there. The one thing I would say about that, having talked to a few builders that do it that way, those are real costs. And I mean, obviously you're on the accounting side, so I'm mm-hmm. preaching the choir, mm-hmm. I think. I mean, those are real costs that if you were not building that house, you would not need that truck. You would not defil- You would not need, <clears throat> excuse me, you would not need the fuel to drive to that job site. I think sometimes explaining that to a client, you know, as you're walking down, say, well, this is why you're doing it. I think it, a lot of it comes explaining on the front end. To your point, I think marketing I think each person is just going to receive it differently. Where some people, you might include all of that, but then you're, obviously you're going to have to mark it up higher on the front end, right? Yeah, you definitely will. And that's why we like to think about margin instead of markup. Because at the end of the day, you can you can mark things up, you can add fees, whatever whatever numbers you need to add to get to that gross profit number that allows you to be profitable and have a lifestyle or whatever it is, whatever reason you're in business for. Um, if we talk about margin, it, it normalizes for all of that. So margin is just sort of the flip side of markup, right? You have costs, you mark it up, that's your price. Margin is just the price minus the cost. It's kind of the same thing. But we like to talk in margin because it makes it more apples to apples. Well, can we use an example? Yeah, let's I do think it. that's something that's, you know, in 18 years of building, it's something only recently, I mean, I've heard the terms before, but now I'm really diving into it because, you know, let's just use 10% as, a, as an example mm-hmm. for easy numbers. So you have a... a Hundred thousand dollars, and you have explained to the audience the difference between ten percent markup and ten percent margin on, let's say, a hundred thousand um, dollar widget that you're selling. Yeah, you have a hundred thousand dollar widget. Let's say it costs you eighty dollars to build it, eighty thousand yep. dollars to build it, and you sell it for a hundred thousand dollars. Your margin is twenty thousand dollars on a hundred thousand dollars, twenty percent. If you want to make a, a margin of twenty percent, 
on an $80,000 cost item, you have to mark it up more than 20%. Like right? 23, 25%, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you mark it up 25% on 80,000, I don't know what the number that gets you to, but that's yeah. going to be closer to your margin. So yep. um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. It's 25%. 25% of 80 is, is 20, 80 plus 20 is 100. So a 25% markup is a 20% margin. I mean, just the difference between charging markup to margin, you just made yourself 5% more to your um, to your bottom line. Yeah, no? you just have to know what you're looking at. And it's easy if you take out a napkin and you scribble the numbers out and you say margin versus markup, it matters. And why do we care about it? Uh, so when you're looking at, at your overhead expenses, you have to be able to cover those with your margin and whatever's left, that's what you get at the end of the day. And so if we're talking about average numbers, which is what people really care about, what are they interested in? How do I compare to what I'm seeing for averages around the country? Let's talk about margin. Yeah. So for something that's, uh, you're getting $100,000 for a house, you know, it's more like a million dollars. We're seeing the good builders, their margins are 20% or better. Really? So if they're, wow. s if they're selling a million dollar house, it costs them $800,000. Yep. That's a good builder. Great builders are doing better than that. Wow, that's impressive. So uh, somebody who's building something that's differentiated, they're getting 25% or better oftentimes. Somebody who's building at scale, which gives them the ability to purchase cheaper, mm -hmm. right? So they can get the same furnace that you're buying for a little bit less than you're buying it for because they have national contracts or whatever. And there's other things that they can scale. They're getting 25%. So that's what their margins are. So their markup they don't really have a markup necessarily because they're not like cost plus builders right. all the time. Because they're doing a flat fee, but right. then they're building their margin into it. Right. So their markup is something, you know, north of 30%. That's what the good builders and even the great builders, some builders are doing better than that. And it's wow. it's crazy to think about that. The builders that and are doing- new home, because I know remodels are a totally separate structure. Yep, new home. Wow. So the builders that are doing better than that are rare, and it's probably only 5% of all builders. And they have something- Exceptional. That's unique, and yep, it could be the market that they're in. So builders in Napa, they're able to make really high profit margins because they're selling to people with deeper pockets who want something special. Yep. And um, so there's a, a few other parts of the country where you're seeing really high margins. In certain parts of the countries, you're seeing depressed margins for a lot of reasons: economic reasons, competitive pressures, um, cost of building. I met a builder at the Contractor Coalition Summit, which I've talked to a little bit on the show. And he was um, from Canada, and he works in like a five mile radius. And he was telling me he, you know, he's been north of 40, 50 percent. He only does remodels, but even so, like that remodel margin on that, and they're huge. I mean, they're big, big stuff. And he's like, we have an. In fact, he goes, we turned down a job that that's beyond four miles. We won't take it, which is pretty crazy. But the, his area, to your point, is so hyper specific, and they do such quality work as their differentiator that they can command a higher margin. And people wait years to work with this couple or this this, this company, which is mm -hmm. a pretty amazing story. Yeah. And and really, that's a function of marketing, right? And so when we think about marketing, which you're a great marketer, right, Mark? Try to be. Yeah. <laughs> Half of my name is in it. <laughs> so it's his brand. He's got this great reputation and a great brand, and it's built. Uh, his brand was built on his product. So he lets his product or his service lead his business. And so the fact that he has a great reputation gives him that ability to charge more. Mm -hmm. So you need to find that thing. And Lennar, they don't have a brand that is exceptional. Like nobody aspires to be in a Lennar home necessarily. Um, so they don't rely on that, right? They rely on buying stuff really cheap, value engineering. Some people call it cutting corners, but they call it trying to make money. <laughs> right. It's so, a business. Yeah. I think they're, to your earlier point, they are much they're much more on the ball in running a business that happens to be building. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly right. So think about twenty percent as a decent target yep. gross margin to make. So the money that you make from your clients minus the cost that it takes to get there of direct costs. So this is subcontractor labor and materials, and maybe your own internal labor that's directly attributable to a property. Right. Twenty percent. You're starting to play ball. Yep. Now you have to pay all your people. You got to pay for your office. You got to keep the lights on. Think about that as 10% is really good, right? 10% so, of that 20. Yeah. So let's say it's a million. Let's say you only build one house this year, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. And you get a million bucks for it. Costs you 800000 to build it. You have $200,000. Yep. Of that two hundred to run your business, if you're running the business for 100000 or less, that's good. 
So 10%, and that leaves 10% to put back in your pocket. So if you think about those numbers as basic, simple numbers to represent, I'm doing a pretty good job, 20, 10, and 10, that's a really good rule of thumb. Writing that down. Yeah. Like, we have to relook at our books. Luckily, yep. I know the guy who can help me run the, some of that. Um, walk me through, you know, I meant to go there in the beginning, but let's go there now that people have kind of understood a little bit your, I think your perspective, your broad is broadband perspective, if you will, is just really unique. And you're the first person on the show that has kind of that national reach that can talk in specific numbers, which is going to be really helpful for our audience. Um, actually, before we go that, let's go into remodeling. Um, of the companies you work with, what percentage would be new home versus remodel, roughly? We have, and we have this data, but I'll shoot off, yeah. um, shoot, shooting from the hip, 40% of our companies are exclusively new home builders. Okay. Another 40 are a mixture of new home and remodel or like major additions mm -hmm. and renovations. And then the remaining 20 is a mixed bag of commercial contractors, trade contractors, um, people who are involved in like institutional building, uh, you know, renovating a nursing home or something like that. Uh, so we have a pretty wide variety. And then we maybe have just this very small handful of legacy clients that are just tangentially related to real estate. Um, so we do have some property developers, some property managers, but for the most part, we're dealing with builders and remodelers. And if you do like on a, a commercial construction, let's say I was to build like an apartment building, mm -hmm. would you work with companies that do that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, and we'll dive in a little bit later about, you know, what you do on a daily, weekly, monthly level more specifically, but going back on this, on this high level remodeling percentage across the country, like you did for new homes. What are you seeing from remodel percentages across the country? It's actually not that much better than new home construction. Really? And I think it might be because, and this is very general. So if you're a remodeler and I'm saying this, don't feel offended. Um, remodeling contractors tend to be earlier in their journey. And some are a little bit less sophisticated from a business perspective. Um, and so I think that is one of the reasons that the margins aren't more than what you would expect. Because the average is bringing it down. Yeah, maybe. Um, also, I think remodelers have a tougher time estimating costs. So they have a lot more unexpected costs that they're not able to pass through. And, and you know, remodeling is... A, Really, really challenging business. Oh man, for and sure, it's very competitive. I like it, but I like a mix. I mean, I couldn't do only remodeling, mm -hmm. and I, it, there is something very rewarding about going into a home. We're working on a beautiful one right now by Lake Harriet, and um, you know, when we're done, it's just going to be incredible. I, there is a different reward in repurposing an existing house mm -hmm. than building new, um, but it's it's definitely harder. Yeah, yeah. So you know, their margins are generally a little bit better, but not not as much as you would think. Okay. And I think it has to do with competitive pressures and just the building homes is tough. Remodeling is a little bit tougher in almost every way. Uh, uh, so that shows in the financials. Okay. Interesting. I uh, appreciate the perspective. Let's go back a little bit uh, about your journey, where you started. Tell us a little bit about uh, about Chris. Uh, how could, far back do you want to go? Well, the day you were born. <laughs> um, let's I don't know, talk about- It was uh, a hot day in August. It was August. a hot day in August. August 1982. What? Oh, in 1982. <laughs> All right. I like it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have a birthday here. Um, okay. Maybe we should save this podcast and we'll put it on your birthday. <laughs> nice. uh, that's too late. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah. Give, give us your background. So I, I know you were in, you were working with some national builders at one time and, but maybe even before that, were you accounting major? Like how did you, no. why, why, why construction finance? Yeah. Let's go back. I studied finance, um, locally here at the university of Minnesota at the Carlson school. And I was attracted to finance because I really liked, uh, investments in the markets. So I was really interested in the markets. And, and as I um, went through my academic journey, I started to realize I really liked planning. Um, and I took a job that was really involved in planning and helping big businesses plan. And it was at Intel, the computer chip company, mm -hmm. which at the time, in 2005 when I graduated, it's a sexy company to be a part of. So I did that. And then I didn't like it anymore. I wanted to come back to Minnesota. If it wasn't for a girl or anything, you know? <laughs> That's for Carlson School of Management. Yeah, so I, I took I took that job and then I came back because that was out west and I came back to Minnesota and um, I got involved in management consulting. So I was doing post merger integration for a big uh, a big consulting firm, management consulting firm. So company big company A wants to buy big company B and these are like Fortune 500 style companies. They do it, they make the purchase, and then somebody has to come in and clean it up. Yeah. Right. And I was part of a team that did that. While I was doing that, I had a friend who was making a bunch of money in real estate. Yeah. And this guy 
can barely read, but he's ex- <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but that's hilarious. There's going to be a few people who know who I'm talking about, yeah. so I won't get too detailed in it. And <laughs> hey, if you're listening, buddy, it's a it's a good joke. All right, uh, <laughs> he can barely read, but he's the best poker player you've ever met in your life, and he's very very business savvy, and he's just a he's a great business person. Um, and he was making it for himself, and he started developing land. And um, they needed help getting a bank loan. And they knew that I was a finance guy, even though I had nothing to do with real estate. And said, hey, can you help me put together some package? We call it a deck in the finance world. Put together a deck to help get this money. And So, so you'd go, what, pitch private capital, a venture capital? I pitched like to a who? community bank because oh, okay. it's the cheapest money. Okay. Here, here's another tip for you guys looking to build spec homes or finance any sort of construction project. Community banks almost always going to be the cheapest money. You know, there's easier money out there for sure, but it's usually more expensive. So the first idea was to pitch community bank. And this, the the first banks we were pitching were more like small regional banks. And actually we we put the deck together, pitched it to them, and they gave us the money. And this was in um, this was 4 million bucks in the fall of 2008. Wow. It was, Oof, I think time. we closed the loan in August. Like, oh. Two days later, the world would have exploded. I think the guy got fired, actually, for doing the loan. It ended up being an, an incredible loan. It performed wonderfully. It was a development out in Plymouth. Um, was at a school. It was just the right time, right place, actually. So it worked out. How does that work out? Because, I mean, obviously, the stock market dropped, what, seven, ten thousand 10,000 points within a few weeks of that period of time. How could that loan have worked out? Well, a little bit of luck, I guess. But the homework was done, and, you know... It's uh, a little bit of luck, a little bit of skill. Okay. So it was a 54 lot development and <clears throat> it was at the end of the line. So there was, this was in 2008. This was the only new construction development in Plymouth, essentially. Oh, wow. And <clears throat> the builders had a great idea and a great plan to just build spec houses, which sounded really dangerous. And they were able to get the financing to build the spec houses, but people were still relocating for work. And when you relocate, you don't have time to build a custom house. And the companies that were relocating them, Targets and General Mills and Cargill and United Health Group, they're like people wanted to live out west. They wanted to live where do where do relocation people look to live? Right. Where are the best schools? Exactly. Money Magazine had an article come out right when we closed the deal on this land, Plymouth, Minnesota, number one city in America. Yeah. Best school districts in Minnesota. Why is that is always up there? The only place you could buy a new house, our neighborhood. Yeah. So it was a little bit of luck, but the deck we put together to get the bank financing had all of this stuff in sure, it. Yeah. So it was a, it, you know, it was a nice, perfect storm of things. So um, at that point, it's I nice was- nice to hear a success story during that time. <laughs> right. I actually bought a home very similar wise at a schools. I bought my first major remodel in 2008. <laughs> mm-hmm. I closed on it in uh, September, August. I did it too nice. And I was, I was stuck with a home, you know, for two years. I had to rent it out. I finally got out from under it, but it was a, uh, obviously- uh, someone once told me that I got my master's degree in business and half the time and quadruple the expense. <laughs> <laughs> I have a master's degree in business. It's very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and it took me 11 years. No big deal. Okay, no big deal. Well, I got it done in tw- two years, but I spent a lot of money losing money on that thing. Lot Actually, only seven, money. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, it costs you a lot more money, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. we we I helped out with the development. One of the builders that was in the development, there was two builders, he said, hey, I, I need some help getting financing. I need some help with finance stuff. What do you think about helping me? And I said, I don't know. I have a pretty cool deal helping these big companies. And he just was a, a person that I really admired at the time. Um, and I took the job. So I helped him with his home building company. And we grew to a fairly small but very reputable builder in the Twin Cities. He had a company that everybody admired. He built really, really solid homes, not necessarily – like design forward, like Rick and Amy Hendel, but certainly like a really solid home, really good craftsmanship, really good um, functional layouts for families. Mm -hmm. And we took that from being a fairly small company to one of the biggest, actually the biggest privately held builder in the Twin Cities. That's amazing. And that that was, I worked there roughly from 09 to 18. And 18 is when month end started. So that's the origin story. 
That is well. That's wow. You, you had a lot of time in the trenches to figure it all out. Yeah. And so I assume during that time, basically you took all your finance knowledge. Obviously now you have all this building knowledge, and you're like, I want to help other builders. So month end. Why don't you describe a little bit about what month is? I'll just read it here for a second because I mean I was on your web page a little bit this morning. I love your motto. It just says accounting for construction pros. Partner with the professional bookkeepers and controllers who know construction and work exclusively with construction professionals. Month end, the most important tool in your tool belt. I especially like that last part. Right? <laughs> like the marketing of that. Um, yeah, walk us through you know um, what you do for builders out there that are listening, and um, I just think it's a really unique service. I think it's it deserves the time to understand like how you can help people. Because to your point, financial literacy as well as understanding the business. I feel like you, if you don't have good data, if you don't have the information, the life of your industry, which is cash flow and understanding it, um, it really puts, it really handcuffs what you can do as a company. Um, so anyway, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, basically your, li- your list of services and what you do and how you actually help these builders do some of the success stories that you, that you're talking about. Yeah. There's not enough, there's not a lot of service providers. There's not enough for sure. And there's not a lot, enough really high quality software providers that are really looking at this industry. I think there's plenty of people who have tried, but the industry is complicated. There's no standardization. Like we said earlier, and it's really just an underserved group. It's it's one of the largest parts of our GDP. It's one of the largest parts of our economy, yet there's not a lot of month ends out there that are servicing these folks. So first of all, there's an opportunity. Um, not a lot of people doing it, not a lot of people that have the knowledge or expertise, and not a lot of people that want to do it. Uh, it's tough business. Accounting's a crappy business. Home building's a pretty tough and generally it's sort of, sort of a crappy business, right? <laughs> I mean, it can be glamorous yeah, at times. Yeah. You get to you get to stand and look at this thing that you built and it's going to be there for 100 years or more and there's there's a certain romance in that. There's zero romance in accounting and <laughs> which is great because there's zero competition as well. Yeah. But uh, so builders are underserved and so month end serves builders and we're basically taking all of this data that's out there and organizing it in a, such a way that's meaningful for the builder and then interpreting it. Um, So financial statements, they don't really speak to a lot of people. And even accountants that have been doing this forever, when it comes to construction financial statements, it's a little bit of a different language. So our company essentially does the books. It's as simple as that. So we take take all the data, we assemble it into financial statements and information. We try to provide insights to the builders. And the part that makes this more complicated than it should be is that more and more builders are using construction management software like builder trend, like co-construct. And that adds a little bit of a wrinkle where the old school accountants, they're just not interested in in dealing with that. They don't understand it. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want their cheese moved. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And, and building and accounting are notorious industries for not wanting to change. And <clears throat> so we just fill this need of providing insights to builders. And it all starts with first getting the data right composing it into information, explaining what this stuff means, and then helping builders sleep better at night. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody like us, we're obviously in the onboarding phase. So, you know, as for those listening, you know, we've been building for about 18, 19 years. And, um, you know, we use QuickBooks. We've had an account, obviously, due to journal entries, things like that. Um, I saw the last five, six years, we've used uh, build, build Tools originally, and now we use Builder Trend, and it's a much more robust software. Um, and now we're, we're, as we've grown and we have complexity that we want to have help managing and just have better financial tools, we obviously approached you. And um, I'm really excited to get to the point where we can do some of this forecasting and do some of this, you know, uh, call it post-op, because right now it feels like we're definitely having open heart surgery. But walk me through, I mean, you've told me even before we started, hey, here's our onboarding process. We're, you know, every week we're meeting for an hour, two hour. Um, you know, you're do- most of our, or this is the first time I've actually met you in person. Everything else has been on Zoom. And uh, and essentially we, we, we work through this. We work, basically correct anything that's incorrect or just basically change how we're viewing it. And then at some point you, there's a handoff baton and then you will have, you know, obviously I assume monthly or, you know, biweekly. W- walk us through a little bit of this onboarding phase if someone out there is, you know, considering, you know, working with month end. Yeah. Working with month end or really working with anybody who you're bringing on board as an outsourced accountant. There's other people who do what we do. Uh, but when you do bring someone on board and how we particularly do it, it's really split into two, two sections um, when we're onboarding somebody. First, we're cleaning up their old stuff. We're making sure the books are right. We've never, I've never seen books that are right. So I talk to probably between five and 10 builders a week who want to use our services. And I take between 15 and 60 minutes in these, their sales calls really. They're reaching out to us, hey, are we a good fit with the, for each other? 
and I look at their books. And I either do it live in front of them on their on the call, or they give me access and I log in. And I've never seen books that were accurate. One, so pause right once. there. What does that mean? I mean, these other firms have accountants. We've had accountants. Mm-hmm. What do you mean their books aren't right? What does that mean? So let me give you an example. You have assets, mm-hmm. right? One of your assets might be a truck. On your financial statements, the truck has a positive number. One example of a book that's incorrect is the truck, which is 60000 bucks. It's listed as negative $60,000. So that's an example of something that's wrong. So when I'm going through these books, and I probably have seen twelve or thirteen hundred builders' books, I've not seen one single set that's of books incredible. that were right. And I think it's it's just it's because it's a lot. There's a lot of reasons why it's not right. Um, so what was the original question? Dave? Well, no, you're kind of answering basically <laughs> how do you do the cleanup? I mean, you're walking us through the process. Oh yes, <clears throat> and basically this first thing is to see if it's a good fit. Yeah, if it is a good fit. I mean, so we clean up the books. Clean up the books. They're 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 messy. Sometimes it's very minor things. How We're, often do they push back and say, "No, Chris, you're new to the scene. You, of course, you're going to say that." The the problem is like that's that's the interesting thing about accounting. So I was a fin- my degree is in finance. I got finance uh, accounting education later in life. I got my C- my CPA in 2018. So I got that education later in life because I saw how important it was, and I wanted to fill in some gaps in my knowledge. And I realized you really have to have this fundamental fundamental academic accounting knowledge to be able to understand this stuff. So very few of these books are prepared by anybody with that expertise. They're prepared by their wife, yeah. their husband, yeah. their sister-in-law, their brother. And those people- Or, no, or nobody. Or, I bet there's people out there that don't have any idea where they're at. They're right, <laughs> right. So the books, and you're like, this is not a good fit. Uh, we're going to end this call. This will be a 15 minute call. Yeah, <laughs> no, like the we'll people, the people who say they have really clean books are the people who always have the messiest books, and the people who think their stuff is a disaster, they're usually in decent shape. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think it's because they care more about it and they're more tuned into it, and they're like, yeah, this is a disaster, and there's like three transactions out of place. Sure. And the people are like, ah, my books are perfect. You're not going to have any problems. Like, burn these things down. <laughs> Let's start over yeah. from scratch because. These, I mean, this is worthless. This yeah. stuff is, yeah. anyways. Yeah, yeah, no, wow, that's a very interesting perspective. <clears throat> so we got to clean them up. Yep. Uh, and it gives you a good foundation for, for knowing what to do next. Um, and then, so we do this whole cleanup. And then on the other side of it, we're doing process reorganization and reengineering. Uh, and the processes are related to the financial processes. Like, what do you do when you get a bill? What happens next? Do you log it? Do you not log it? Do you pay it? Do you not pay it? Uh, Is it going on a draw? Is it being paid cash? All those things. Going through a title company. So we figure out what the processes are, and then we try to get the technology to that match the That has to be process. super frustrating, as you mentioned earlier, that every single builder does something, does it differently. Everyone does it differently, and most of them have to do it differently. You live in a different state. You're in a remodeler versus a, a builder. You're building an apartment complex that's financed versus one that's built on cash. They're all completely different. You're using Builder Trend versus Procore. Different. So... Our onboarding is fairly standardized, maybe 70% of it's standardized, but 30% of it is custom uh, because everybody's different and they have to be different because the business of construction, there's nothing standard about it. I mean, this for those listening, this is kind of mind blowing. In Minnesota, we have to have lien waivers, which everyone who builds in Minnesota knows about lien waivers. Essentially, if I pay ten thousand to a subcontractor, let's say it's my plumber, he you know says he verifies that he's received ten thousand, he re- releases his lien rights. We give it to the title company, on and on it goes. I had heard that like when I was asking about these different software companies, like why don't they do this? And they're like, well, hey, in Florida, you just type a zero or a one. Like I think a zero means it's still open, a one means it's closed. I'm like, what? That's crazy. You don't have to put the dollar amount. And in Texas, they don't even need them. I'm like, oh my word. My joke there was like, you just have to put a 45 caliber bullet, you know, as a receipt and you're good to go. And like, and even across the country, because you work all over the country, forget builder to builder, but now we're talking state to state, different rules, different mm-hmm. compliances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tennessee, they're very strict about retainage. Even for you know small residential builders, really, yep. So there's a lot of nuances all over the country. Um, in Washington State, just one second, because yep. a lot of listeners in commercial or sorry in residential won't understand what retainage oh, okay. is. Explain just what retainage is on a. Let's say you're building a uh, million dollar. Um, I'll use an easy number: a million dollar home. Walk us through uh, what retainage is. Yeah, so retainage is basically security that people are going to do what they say they're going to do. So if a subcontractor from the buyer's point of view, both. So a subcontractor, like a framing subcontractor, does $10,000 worth of work and sends you a $10,000 bill, you pay them $9,900 or $9,000, depending on what retainage percentage you're using, Mm -hmm. and then you pay them the rest later. How much later? 
Uh, is it, that negotiable? Yeah, uh, it's, it depends. Really, it depends. Usually you pay it, it's like a, pound, a punch list item. Uh, and then when you're uh, invoicing your customer, so let's say you're invoicing the customer for that framing bill and you're invoicing the customer, you're making at least a 25% markup, right, Mark? Mm-hmm. Well, so, now, I mean, wow, after talking so, to you, I'm going to have to really up my rate. <laughs> so, Anyone who's built a house with Mark D. Williams Custom Homes, you guys have got an incredible deal. Unbelievable Feel deal. Feel free just to wire me or Venmo me any sort of funds you want. Yeah, cash. Thank you. Cash. Because we can avoid taxes oh, that cash. way. cash. Okay. No, yeah. we don't. Should I go straight to uh, <laughs> <laughs> Send some of it my way. Send, send some of it to Chris. <laughs> so you send the customer an invoice for 12000 yep. They only pay you 11000 or whatever the you know the retainer amount is. So it's retainage makes it you know it's, you hit him in the paycheck. Yep. Right? You, yep. You're you, holding money back. How does that get verified? Is it like escrow? Like we, we often do escrow at the end of a job. How is it different than escrow? It's sort of like escrow, but it's not a third party that's holding the money. Who's holding it? The client. The client's holding the money that they owe you, and you're holding the money that you owe the subcontractor. So, so ultimately, the subcontractor is the last one then would, that would get paid. It depends. Just like. Sometimes you'll pay a framer before because he needs know. to get paid. I mean, yeah, they're exactly. notorious like, hey, I need to get paid, you know, now. And they're a finite resource. You're like, hey, I've got to make some business decisions mm-hmm. here. Yep. I need to pay him in full if I want to keep him happy. Right. So, oh, let me let's use that as an example. Let's say because I've heard before, like architects sometimes will re, will, will require a retainage on behalf of the client, even here in Minnesota. And let's just say your retainage is ten percent on this. That's a retainer. It's a little different than retainage. So retainers happen on the front end. Okay. All right. So an architect says, "All right, you're going to work with me. Give me a retainer. Give me ten grand, and then I'm going to start billing my time against that ten grand. And if you end up not working with me, I'll give you the difference back." Or sure, I've seen that. Okay, I'm think I'm glad you brought that up. That seems to happen more with the client that they work against. Yeah. I've never and I have not worked with an architect that requires retainer or retainage to me as the general contractor. Um, maybe that happens. I guess I've not run across that, but yeah. I do know I've heard it before where they use the retainage. And so let's say I oh let's say the, the architect is at, saying retainage for me that they're not they're they're going to vet all their finances for on behalf of their client mm-hmm. to make sure it's all done the way they want it drawn mm-hmm. and then before the title company releases this ten thousand dollar check they're the the architect will sign off on it so let's say my framer on you know let's say he's two months into the project and wants to get paid the ten thousand if I say hey I need to keep him happy I'm going to pay him the full amount so then I the the, the it just means that I'm t- taking the risk. Essentially, does that happen or is that against you can't do that? It happens all the time. Okay. Um, you know, like in Tennessee, where retainage is very common for all kinds of projects, um, it happens all the time. So the builder might just never enforce the retainage and they'll always just pay the subcontractor and keep full. it all to themselves. Yeah, they'll just pay the subcontractor because they know they need it and they know that that person always does their job. So they're not worried because you have a relationship. Yeah. Yep. You know, I mean, it's you mentioned before that it can help protect the I thought it was only there to protect the buyer. How can it protect? Uh, let's say in our case, the builder. Well, just think about a painter. You have your painter come out. They send you a bill for thirty grand. You pay the bill for thirty grand. You come out to the house, and there's they well, did, okay, they did so, a terrible. I job. mean, I wouldn't do that. Number one. So, okay, <laughs> I guess. So we have retainers without really. Okay, that's I mean, right. We obviously, really you know, we'll do progress payments, and then before we do the final payment, we'll go and do a site check. Okay, yeah. so it's we don't necessarily have it called out. It's but insurance. We do it. I yeah, gotcha. it's insurance. Okay. Um, okay, back to the whatever question we were on before, but basically walking us through. So you're done, you've done the cleanup. You've got us on board. How long does that process take? Eight weeks. Eight weeks. Yep. Very specific. Well, we need to get it done in eight weeks. So yep. a lot of what we do at Month End and what we try to help our clients do is we set a goal, and then we design the processes to work toward the goal. So okay. we say it takes eight weeks. Sometimes it takes longer, right? Sometimes we can get it done shorter, but we're going to do it in eight weeks, yep. uh, and we have a process to get there. What happens after that? After that, you're transitioned to your accounting team, who's also part of your onboarding. So there's- I think that's really smart, by the way, because you build this incredible relationship. It's like, you know, you're training for a marathon. It's all your hardest training is with that person. And now, you know, you're after the post-marathon, if you will, but you're still kind of in this running group analogy. <laughs> and they need to know what happens, right? Yeah. So you get four people when you hire month end. You get the onboarding manager, you get the onboarding coordinator, you get the controller, and you get the bookkeeper. And those first eight weeks, they're all working together. The onboarding manager and the onboarding coordinator, they disappear after eight weeks because their job's done. The controller and the bookkeeper, they've been a part of it. So they've been part of the process design. They've documented the new processes because some of those processes will be ours. Some will be yours. And that controller and that bookkeeper, obviously, were part of that design. They have to be a part of it for the next five years or 20 years or three years or however long we're going to work together. So... um, after eight weeks, they're just running your business 
financials for you. Yeah. And hopefully onboarding's done. Sometimes there's some outstanding items. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sometimes there's some outstanding items still, um, but generally we can get most of them done in the in those eight weeks. Oh, that's amazing. How did you come up with that idea? I mean, it's genius when you say it like that, but I'm assuming from day one you didn't have that idea. No, I assume that evolved from just the evolution of your business. Exactly. And we have a real Kaizen culture at our company. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, it's continuous improvement. So no matter what we're doing, we're trying to get better every day. And um, Is that a philosophy? How do you spell that? K-A-I-Z-E-N. It's uh, just a Japanese term for essentially how a lot of Japanese folks live their life. It's part of the Japanese culture in general. And this is a term they use it. It's really was popularized in America with um, Toyota. You know, it's a Japanese company, but they did a lot of like American manufacturing here. And so Toyota embodies this idea of Kaizen, continuous improvement. And that's why they have really solid vehicles that have you know, high quality, low defects. So continuous improvement, like have you seen um, – Ichiro dreams of dreams of sushi. Sushi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ich, it's not Ichiro. Ichiro it's dreams of sushi. sushi. It's, he has a he has a sushi place. It was on yeah. Netflix in the like the subway of, and it's like some of the most exclusive sushi in the world. Yeah, it's the and best it's ever. Like this one, yeah. And he's been doing it for seventy years, and yeah. and he's a he's one hundred and fifty years old or something, <laughs> right? Yeah. And he he's just trying to make his sushi better the next day than he made it the day before. Right? Yeah. I know it makes me want to go. I watched it like six, seven years ago. It's funny. It's I, was, so good. I was actually going to go to Japan. We've changed our plans here. But I uh, I actually thought about going there other than it would be ridiculously expensive, I believe. Uh, but they talked about a lot of dignitaries have eaten there. I mean, Bill Clinton, I think at the time that the book was written or the movie was deal, you know, they had him over there and a number of other celebrities had gone over there and it's been very well publicized. But uh, I like that. That's uh, he definitely commitment to his craft. Yeah. And, and you see that. Um, my wife and I went to Tokyo and it was amazing. You see that with everybody. If somebody is in charge of... Did you eat there? Oh, I ate 17 meals a day. It's the best place ever. No, no, ever. no, no. At, at, oh. at Ichiro's. No. <laughs> no. 17 times I ate at Ichiro's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's this commitment to getting yes. better. Yeah. And so with onboarding especially, that's where we can focus a lot of time on getting better because we're still not that good at it. We're still just scratching the surface of how good we can be at, at onboarding. And we have a long ways to go. And we've onboarded 150 builders at this point, And I think there's still a ton of room for improvement there. Um, this idea of handling uh, bookkeeping cleanup separate from process is a newer idea that came from this Kaizen. How can we make this better? And and that's what we're trying to do. And, and with our clients, we're also trying to make them better every day. So I, I just saw something on on the plane. It was like Tiger Woods and Dwayne Wade. Okay. Tiger Woods was like teaching Dwayne Wade how to play golf. Dwayne Wade is a terrible, <laughs> terrible golfer, but Dwayne Wade's a cool dude. And he was talking about, he wants to get better at golf and he wants to get better 1% a day. And he's willing to put in the hard work to do it. And you know, that's why Dwayne Wade's a champion. Yep. Right. Because he's always trying to get better. And part of his philosophy isn't just go out and play basketball. It's like, all right, I'm going to go get better today. And I think that's super important in business. I think that's super important for the managers in the business and the leaders to instill that philosophy in their people, right? Mm -hmm. Because it comes from the top down. So if you have a project manager and the project manager's job is really tough, right? And they have to babysit subcontractors and they have to manage budgets and they have to keep things on time. And a lot of times they're negotiating prices. They're dealing with homeowners. They don't have time to think about how can I be better at my job but I think it's important to instill this culture in any business where you give them the opportunity to get better and give them the tools to get better and give them the time to get better. And um, so in terms of creating a, an onboarding process that works, we're, we're, we're not even that good at it yet, uh, but we're trying to get better every day. It's funny. Just yesterday, I read a book about the 1%. And uh, I know you're a big biker. I was going to save that for later, but now is a good time to bring it up. Um, um, my team and I are reading Atomic Habits. I've read it before, but I'm reading it again. And um, it was right before. So the 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 London Olympics were was what, 2008 or 12? Somewhere around there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the reason I'm bringing it up is the British cycling team does not have a long history of excellence in cycling. And they, they got this coach to come over. And he basically said, we're going to be better at 1%. So they tried out all the different kinds of neoprene for you know their shoe covers. They tried on different spandex that was better in cold versus you know indoor tracks and outdoor tracks. They tried you know different PSIs on their tires. They tried different lubricants for actually rubbing down their wheels, all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. And Chris is nodding his head because he's an 
extreme uh, road bike lover, so he's loving former, this. Former, former. Ah, you're still awesome. And um, but anyway, long story short, is they started winning in the one percents. They started you add up all those one percents, mm-hmm. and they made huge inroads. Um, they ended up, I think, at um, when the Olympics were in London, um, it was basically they won like thirty or forty percent of all the the road medals available. And then since then, like Chris Froome, a number of Tour de France cyclists have come out of that training group, all because of this two decade long dedication to the one percents, mm-hmm. and from sleeping to nutrition, and you know there wasn't like a twenty percent increase in any single one, right? But man. Obviously, you add up a lot of little half quarter percents and it adds up. And that's a great analogy to home building because great builders are able to make a 10% operating profit margin. So, you know, they build a bunch of houses and they can put 10% of the sales price of the house in their pocket at the end of the day. Pretty good builders are putting 5% in their pocket. So when we're talking about in that philosophy, I think the British team, they're calling it marginal gains. <clears throat> that philosophy is a, is a great translation to home building because the margins are thin. Like if you're thinking about a pretty good builder making 5% and let's say you get 1% better, if you get 1% better on your top line, that's 20% better on 5%. So your 5% is now 6%. So if you were making 500 grand, which is fantastic for most builders, now you're making 600. That's a big deal. $100,000 is a big deal. So that marginal gains concept is great for builders because in cycling, Unlike a lot of sports, like football, there isn't this marginal gain philosophy, right? It's a game of inches, but it's not like if I lift weights just a little bit better today, our team's going to be that much better. But cycling is is like that. Cycling is like if I have a better night's sleep by just a little bit, we're going to be a better team. And we're going to be able, just because your body is so stretched, that last little ounce you can get out of it. And in home building the same way. If you can find a way to get your cabinets and you're building 10 houses a year and you can get those cabinets for three grand cheaper... That's 30 grand. 30 grand on your bottom line is massive. It's just absolutely massive. I think, and I would say for myself, I think per job versus uh, thinking holistic. Now, granted, I'm in a different realm of building, you know, since I think the builder you worked with built, what, 30, 50, 80 homes a year? Hundreds. Hundreds. I mean, I built four, right? And they're so custom. Each one is so different that it's in some ways I can't do that. But that being said, that doesn't mean I couldn't try to think in terms of like a bigger a bigger perspective. Well, you can systematize your business. So certain things that take a long time don't take a long time anymore. Or for you, a more important approach would be to systematize your marketing, which I think you're really working on. So how do you make sure you're reaching the right people and doing A, B tests with your social ads Mm -hmm. to make sure you're maximizing your marketing spend to get the most amount of eyeballs that are most likely to buy a house from you? Mm -hmm. Like how do you dial that in? And cycling like home building, very similar. Mm-hmm. That is interesting. Um, talking a little bit about your team, how how big is your team? <laughs> I love my team. Uh, the team is twenty five W two employees and then six contractors. Yep. And almost every single one of those person people are servicing clients. We um, want to get our system so dialed in. So when we're talking about marginal gains, we onboarded two new em- employees today. Today is their first day, and I overheard Peter, who's our practice director. Peter, if you're listening. You're the greatest. You're the greatest thing that's ever happened to anybody anywhere. Wow! Except for praise. except for my wife. Yep. To me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I heard Peter talking to these new employees. Peter's running this whole company about the best way to create bookmarks in your Chrome browser because we want to systematize it as a company. So we're all doing it the exact same way in the same order. Wow! And how much is that going to save you? Well, it's going to save them four minutes a day. I don't know what Peter's actually probably done the math on this. Four minutes a day. And you work how many days a year? Two hundred. That's eight hundred minutes. Wow, right? that's that's a cool. That's a great analogy. Eight hundred minutes. How many uh, hours analogy. is that? That's a great sample. Yeah. yeah, that's like fifteen hours or something, right? So if we add up all of those little things, like if you have twenty five people saving a day and a half each per year, that's a lot of time. It, it's huge. So it's and that's it, one thing. That's just organizing your web browser. That's it. <laughs> so our onboarding, um, our our new employee onboarding has come a long way. We formed this onboarding and training committee, and it's come a long way really quickly. And um, and those little things really add up. Again, I know we were talking about marginal gain. So we have 25 people on our team. We have some contractors, and we try to get them all do do the things that we can systematize and create consistency in. Do everything the same way for everybody. Um, that way, also if if your 
Mark, you have a, a bookkeeper and a controller, and they're servicing you. And a year from now, they might get so sick of you that they don't want to service you anymore. Well, if we have the systems in place, there's no reason we can't transition that to another controller and another bookkeeper with zero pain because the systems have everything perfectly is, documented. I love, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I was attracted to you from day one is understanding that we're taking a very, even at baseline, building is very complicated. From the standpoint, there's just a lot going on. It's a very imperfect, it's art. I often explain to our clientele that, you know, this isn't science. There is a lot of art that goes into it. Now there's both obviously, but I love the fact that a builders in general are hot messes as an industry by the sounds of it. We've been late to adopt technology. And I think the more systematic and the more dialed in our approach is, the better, obviously, product we can give our clients and a, a, a journey. But then knowing that on the back end, that you have such detailed processes can help bring some organization to a much needed area for builders, which is the blood. It's the lifeblood. Money is the lifeblood of any business. And so knowing that you guys have that level of detail is very encouraging. Um, I mean, that's really cool how you've done that. You had mentioned before that you try to hire, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I heard this in <laughs> passing, two people a quarter, eight a year. Like you have this very systematic approach even in how you're staffing up your your, right. your deal. And like, I think you told me when you interviewed me, I think we interviewed with you back in uh, September or October and you're like, All right, we have one spot left in November so we can take you on, but we really limit the number of people that we can. So uh, I read a book called Oversubscribed, that you're oversubscribed. More people want to work with you than you can service, which also lets you be um, pick your clientele a little bit. Walk me through a little bit of how you came up with that, and it, you know how that has benefited your business and your clients. Yeah, we learned the hard way. Uh, we've had, we had a relationship with Builder Trend since day one. That's really what gave me the confidence to start this business because I knew they would be a constant referral source. Um, the partnership got really, really tight uh, in 2021. <clears throat> we could talk more about that, maybe, <laughs> but basically, our our feeder system is Builder Trend. That's our marketing powerhouse. That's our engine. They're sending people to us because they know we're going to get the job done for their clients. And so um, when we really turned on the, that feeder, we had basically as many clients as we wanted. And we took on a lot of them all at once. And it was, it was really hard for the employees. And we were working really hard and we were providing okay quality, but I think we could have done a better job. And we had a conversation with, it was essentially me and Peter. And we said, um, how do we want, do we want this to be a long-term play or a short-term play? All right, short-term play, you take as many as you can, you build up that revenue, you sell the company. Or do we want this to be a lifestyle company, something that we're gonna nurture and grow for a long time? If we want it to be that, we gotta do a better job managing our growth. Because we're growing too fast, quality suffered. We couldn't hire fast enough and train fast enough. The knowledge required to get this work done takes a long time to acquire. Uh, we can train, we can provide really good resources for our team, but nothing replaces experience. And we can make that process go faster, but you got to get the experience. And you can only get that experience through time. And you can't just hire 20 people at once because there's not enough exposure to clients if you have 20 people all hired on the same day to get the experience. So we said, all right, let's just make this Henry Ford, right? Yeah. Let's, let's make this. Let's make widgets. Let's make this an assembly let's line. Black trucks. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, can, you can get one color. Yep, I love that story. Yeah, any color you want. As long <laughs> as, as long it's as... black. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> Greatest sales line of all time. Yeah, so we just, um, we made an assembly line. So we, we hire two new employees a quarter. We hire them and they start on the same day so we can spread our training time you know, one, one training session, two eyeballs, well, four eyeballs, right? Two yeah. people. <laughs> the accountant doesn't know how many. <laughs> so, um, so we, we mapped it all out. Well, how many, how many new clients, how many new month end team members do we need for how many new clients that we get? And we found the perfect ratio. And so far, what we think is perfect, we're going to continuously evolve that. And as our systems get better, we might be able to onboard three clients a month. But right now we do two clients a month and two new associates a quarter. And we have a process for onboarding the associates and we have a process for onboarding the clients. And the whole idea is to control the quality of the client experience and control the quality of the employee experience because this is knowledge work and the employees are everything. Like they're, they're everything in every organization, but they're especially critical here because we can't replace them with anything, right? They're doing the work. They are the engine. So, um, so, so where, 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 do you, where do your people come from? I mean, where are you oh. finding them? Other than your cycling team, because it seems like 90% of uh, 
your LinkedIn profiles <laughs> that I clicked on this morning. One of them wasn't working. Uh, I'll have to tell you which one it was. But uh, it was funny because as I was going through and looking at their LinkedIn profiles, I was like, every one of their, I liked how you had a picture, like their headshot, mm-hmm. and then you could hit sideways and it'd be like a personal photo. And 80, 90% of them had a like a bike or a racing uniform. And it, you, That's you, good. Yeah, it was, I like that. That's something you can help with. Our, our website and our marketing is generally non-existent because we... I think it's important to market, even if you have a lot of demand, because then you can garner a better price. You have price. an incredible business. I mean, like I mentioned before, I'm going to send you this book when we're done here, Oversubscribed, which essentially is what it is. And we'll we'll chat offline a little bit about that. Well, the website is trash, so thank you for- No, the website for... is not trash. It just could be better. <laughs> and trust me, I just went through a complete rebrand, and you know it's expensive, rebranding, new, new everything, but ultimately it represents you and- um, you know, it can it can sell without you even being there. And so uh, obviously when people meet you instantly, I mean, I don't know that much about finance from the standpoint of accounting, but I, I know people and ultimately I make most of my decisions based on people. And, um, you know, obviously a referral and, uh, but I'd met someone else that knew you as well. And as soon as I met you within, you know, 10 seconds, I was like, okay, this person's impressive. You present yourself extremely well. You clearly know way more than I do, which is a given about anybody in any room. <laughs> They're going to know more than me. And so it's like, I have to make quick value decisions. They're like, okay, I don't know all the details, but I trust this person and they're going to get me there. Plus you have a referral. I mean, I didn't even look at the website. I didn't even check referrals because I didn't need one. I knew somebody. That's still why for all, Mar- and myself included, this is my own advice, that ultimately your referrals and the people that you, you, your best source of future growth and future income and future clients is really from your past. And to your appointment, your commitment to your clientele and to your people. Like I think we're, we celebrate lifestyle and we celebrate the people that we work with better than I think that we have in, at any other point in our, I mean, my history. I mean, is that, oh, for that long, sure. Right? For sure. I feel like we, we talk a lot about the, the mental health, which is really good. We talk about like, is this an enjoyable place to work? And there's a lot of, you know, pop culture that makes fun of, you know, the millennials or whoever, you know, whatever people they want to make fun of. But at the end of the day, like by valuing your people, you have a better product. And what's wrong with having your people rested and, and well re- and come, ready to come and, and crush it for you? I mean, that we all could take a lesson from that. Yeah. Yep. And our people are not rested. They're, <laughs> they are nuts. They're insane. And they're, uh, they have a really hard job and I could not do it. So thanks to those folks who are just warriors. But some people, are person- their personalities are predisposed to being able to do this work and they love the work. Taja, somebody on my team, I don't know how she does it. Um, because it seems like if you're on, have you been on Zoom calls with Taja? If, I don't think I have. She's in a, like a, it always seems like she's in a dark room. So I just picture her <laughs> in this dark room, just grinding and just she has like a filter on or what? I don't, like, I don't, I think she just likes to keep the shades drawn. I don't know. That's hilarious. It'd be really funny to like for an April Fool's if you got like her background that looked like it was in a cave or like, you know, something really. <laughs> it's already there. Though. Right. She is. I think she might actually be in a cave. Maybe she have could some be. bats. Have you ever met her in person? Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We do get together. Oh, so my team, how do I find my team? Yeah. Um, we put, it's a combination of um, us saying, hey, we want your friends to come work with us. And it's a combination of putting an ad out on like indeed.com. Yep. We, we have hired experienced accountants before. We've hired CPAs and experienced accountants, and we fired every single one of them. No way. They don't work. They, Why? They don't work with our system. I think it's because they're not willing to go through the beginning, you know, the beginning part of the process where they learn, where they listen to us. Like, hey, here's how we want you to arrange your bookmarks on your Chrome tab. And they're like, yo, uh, I've been doing this for 10 years. Don't tell me how to arrange my See, browser. It's so funny. The moment I would hear that, I'd be like, <clears throat> oh. That is, I would be all <laughs> over that. That sounds so cool. Like, you know what I'm going to do right now? You're hired. I, well, I'm looking, I'm thinking like this morning because I have like my builder trend. I have like ESPN.com. I have a few other ones. It's like, I bet there's 90% of them that I don't even use. I just need to get rid of them and then organize them. Like, that's funny. What I'm getting out of this is I'm going to reorganize my web browser. Yeah, there you go. I'm not sure why I'm going to re- reorganize everyone else's on my teams. Everybody's. Everybody's. Lock it down. Lock it down. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that'll go over well. So we just we we actually we don't interview for accounting skill. Uh, some people that have it, that's fantastic. That's a bonus. If they're like super experienced accountants, like senior accountants, they're not going to be a fit. We don't even interview them anymore. Um, if they have some accounting experience, that's great, but it's not the most important thing. We care about are you smart, and we can figure that out in the interview. And do you care, which we also can figure out in the interview. And it's a combination of asking good questions and not just accepting like generic answers. Yep. So we drill into it, and we want real examples real experiences, and then whatever somebody's major is. So if somebody majored in philosophy, I'll take whatever knowledge I have about philosophy, which is very limited, but I'll ask them about it. And if they can't provide me an answer, they either weren't paying attention in school 
or they didn't really, they don't really have passion for the thing that they chose to spend four years doing, which is an indicator to me that they're probably not the right person for month end. I have an epic fail story for you on that one that my, that my family ribs me out. I can't believe I'm putting this out on uh, the worldwide uh, <laughs> knowledge base. But so um, I took Spanish in college, but mm-hmm. I was very bad at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was a, you know, a liberal arts degree and I was great at a lot of, you know, I guess what I'm doing now, speech comm, <laughs> which is odd enough. But anyway, long story short, Spanish. So I came to bolstering out your resume, and I didn't say I spoke Spanish free, uh, fluently. I just put in there at the bottom of your resume, it just said Spanish. Just a word. <laughs> just Spanish. That's all it said. But yes, it did imply that I probably spoke Spanish. So I will not say the name of the company. It was a very high-end uh, F- Fortune 100 company here in Minnesota. I went to work with them. I was about 22, and I went to- Target. The- no. Best Buy, three M, and uh, their adhesive division uh, canned me. So anyway, I'm going through the I'm going through the interviews. You know, I think I was doing really good on all of them, and I got to this one. The guy was a former Spanish high school teacher, oh, and he did the entire interview in Spanish. I Busted. tell you what, I was in a I was in a suit, which that was immediate no for me. I sweated. I, I bet I sweat through that suit in about ten seconds. You know when your perspiration just goes through the roof, and I just went, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Needless to say, that was not a uh, not a good fit for me. But my cousin, who's like my brother, oh, there doesn't there's not a month that goes by that they don't uh, rib me about that story. Anyway, he should have. That's perfect. He should have done that. Yeah. I mean, that's hundred. No, I don't yeah. fault him at yeah, all. That's wonderful. That was my bad for <laughs> not just saying that I like Spanish food or I like Spanish breed. No, I should never have had that on the resume. Clearly, I was uh, using my excitement for enthusiastically overselling my capabilities in my <laughs> resume as a 21 year old to get a job. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but there it is. <laughs> um, well, we're, we're getting close on time, but I did want to talk to you about, uh, obviously they're, you know, they're a, one of our sponsors as well. And I've had Matt Cavallo on the podcast, um, adaptive, I'll walk us a little bit through, they've come onto the radar here in the last year. How have they been a fit with month end and, and what you're doing? It's, it's cool how we met. Um, so we have this month end thing going on mm-hmm. and they wanted to build like software mm-hmm. and they got in touch with one of my people and they put, and he put them in touch with me. But at the same time they were building the software product, which is supposed to help builders. I'm building the same thing. I haven't spent too much money on it yet. I'm fi- I'm trying to find the right developer. Um, their ideas were a little bit different than mine, but these people were really good at finding capital. They have a background in it. These are three Stanford guys and you know, what is Stanford? It's technology and it's capital, right? So they're really good at that. They don't know the first thing about home building. I do. They don't know the first thing about accounting and the software is an important accounting tool for builders. I do. It was a perfect match. And um, it was at the perfect time because I was about to spend a lot of money developing software. Sometimes I wish I would have because then it'd be 100% mine. Yep. But they're doing it better than what I would have done it. Yep. You know, they have a different point of view on it than what I have. I My, think it goes back to just a minute to of how you hired people. You're hiring people not that are CPAs, but that are right fit for your culture. You know, the the more I've interviewed people, and I'm, I need something I need to do better at for my own company. But I, I worked with someone that they do disk analysis. You know, like your mm-hmm. you know your red green. There's all these personality tests, and like I think it's enjoyable to do. But at the end of the day, it's really important that you're balancing out your team. But from what you prioritize, the ability to learn, you know, the ability to take instruction and a passion and in, in, in what they're doing. But it seems like even this, the, you weren't scared away that they didn't know anything about building. You had that knowledge base covered. You were you were basically saying, hey, this is a gap that I don't have, but you yep. guys have it in spades. Mm-hmm. And you're able to basically have some sort of a partnership that you're able to develop this. And I know because I've been part of, I guess, some of the beta and just seeing some of, the, some of it behind the scenes and amazing people, again, just knowing that you get to meet a lot of business owners owners and get a, a sense of who they are and what they do. I've been blown away w- by yourself as well as the adaptive team and the fact that how often can you reach out to the owner of a company and say, hey, here's my XYZ problem for my bill pay or accounting or whatever I'm dealing with. And they're like, actually, tell you what, check back with us in 45 days. We'll work on it. And guess what? 45 days later, they actually are building the system around your company. I think that's an incredible story. Now, do they get it right every time? Obviously, no. But the fact that they're willing to basically augment their, you know, their their software around us as they're growing as well, to me, is extremely valuable and, and really just cool to be a part of. Yeah, it's really it, the team is outstanding. They're all really good guys. When we were figuring out if we were gonna, you know, get together, yeah, um, I had a Zoom call with them. I'm like, "What are you guys doing tomorrow? What do, What do you mean?" I'm like, "I'm gonna come to New York. And I'm gonna see what kind of." people you are. I didn't say it like that, but yeah. I'm going to come to New York <laughs> yeah. tomorrow yeah. and let's, let's hang out. I'm going to ask you about philosophy and you better know more than me. <laughs> exactly. Actually talk to, um, 
they they all have really interesting backgrounds. Henry had like the number one Kickstarter campaign in 2014. Really? Like he's he's a genius. He worked for SpaceX. He's fantastic. He told us on the us podcast that he goes, it's easier for him to predict uh, um, uh, uh, rocket science than it is to do uh, coding for builders for their software development. A hundred percent. That's why crazy. there's no. That's why there's no perfect home building software out there because people have a hard time like translating construction it's complicated at least so, I, I guess i get it so math is a standardized industry so they're saying hey math to direct you know for physics to yeah i guess that's what physics or physics right. like that it is like what runs the world right, right. and so okay but home building there's no standard is <laughs> it so henry's like what am i supposed to do here i'm like henry you're the smartest person on the planet what are you talking about <laughs> don't ask me he's like i'm a rocket scientist <laughs> but these builders confuse me right so, and then matt's got a great um great background in real estate and capital mm-hmm. and then frank's Frank's really smart in his own way. He's got a background in public policy, and and he actually has a degree, his undergraduate degree is, I think, in like neuroscience or something like that. I told um, him he has the best mustache this side of Tom Selleck. He looks like Tom Selleck. He's got a killer mustache. So good. And he just had his first kid, and uh, <clears throat> being a dad of three, I sent him my two best things that I've ever had as a dad. I mailed it to him. I thought he was in San Francisco. San Francisco must have been his name because his full name is Francisco. And I kept he's thinking, in Brooklyn. He's in Brooklyn, it's New different. York. And I was it's like going to fill out. I was, re- I was I asked him for his address, and I thought for sure I'd be sending it to San Francisco. And it's like Brooklyn. I'm like, what? I thought for sure. Anyway, word association. But so I actually here's my go-to for anyone you don't know. You can get baby care on this uh, channel, but it's the the free to know sucker. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember getting one uh, from somebody. I'm like, why would I ever use this? And I was like, the most useful thing I've ever had. And then I. I probably sent up some coffee. I don't actually remember what the second gift was. I was so obsessed with the nose Frida. So anyway, he said he used it on on like day two. Nice. Like that's so how there you go. <laughs> Any other aspiring fathers? I sent him a baby Bjorn, like a yeah. to hold him. To, he said that's the kid's favorite place to be, and he can work with the baby oh, on his chest. Those things rock. <laughs> Other than the fact that you get hotter than Hades wearing one of those things, that little baby Especially puts him. off a lot of heat. He's hairy. He's <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> so, okay, good to know. He's Tom Selleck. Uh, Francisco, when you hear this, I apologize, but you do have a killer mustache, dude. Uh, okay, rapid fire as we close up. Favorite business book? Um, most recently, and I guess it's been a, a year since I read it, I read Shoe Dog, and it's not necessarily Ooh, a business a book, one. but there's a lot of business. If you're a business owner, um, or even if you're a, a career Fortune 500 person working your way up the corporate ladder, it's just exciting. Like You, you feel, feel night, Phil Knight's grit and determination and kind of F you attitude. Like, I'm going to get this done. I think this is the best way to do it. He makes a lot of mistakes. He almost blows himself up. Spoiler alert. I think they're making a movie out of it. It's called The Air. It comes out in like a couple weeks. And, you know, Michael Jordan's not even in it. And it's a bunch because the whole thing is based around, as it's Sonny Vaccaro, when he basically signed Jordan uh, in college or high school to the first big, they were the the first ones to say, hey, we're going to take a lot of money, take a star athlete. Now all marketing brands basically take, you know, they, Mm -hmm. you know, make them celebrities based on these brands. But um, he was the first really to kind of launch it. And of course, Michael Jordan's Michael Jordan. Yeah. But the movie got a little flack because Michael Jordan's actually not in it. And uh, he's not in anything. Space Jam. Space Jam. <laughs> Which so, was phenomenal, right? Yeah. But um, Shoe Dog. Yeah. It, just his grit, his determination, his like, I, I know what's best. And yeah, I'm going to fail a couple times and you don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. I love that. Yeah. I just absolutely love that because um, I think there's not enough of Remember that. Remember he was hustling shoes out of his garage and running them this way and running them that way. It's a great, bo- great book. And he's an innovator, right? And he didn't, I mean, he didn't really innovate shoes necessarily. He had people do that for him. But he's a marketing innovator. The idea of paying athletes a ton of money mm-hmm. to get them to endorse your product, like you probably love Phil Knight, right? Yeah. You're, right. Hey, you are a marketing innovator too, Mark. I like it. Well, I'm trying to get everyone to be on the podcast because I just love celebrating stories. So yeah, I guess I'm not a shoe dog. I'm a pod dog. <laughs> house dog. <laughs> yeah, house dog. Yeah, that sounds very tame. I don't think I'm a house dog. Uh, <laughs> more, I'll be more of a wild animal. Okay, we have way gone off script. Uh, there's no script here, people. Okay, uh, what are you listening to now? Do you listen to podcasts? What, how do you self-educate? Oh, man, this is sad. Nerd alert. Right now, I am doing continuing education to learn how taxes work. So I'm a CPA. I have a CPA. So you have to learn a lot about taxes, but you don't really get down into the details. You learn the fundamental foundations about how they work. So I'm not doing anything exciting right now except taking courses on how income tax works and how tax preparation works. Really, the idea is tax is a great complement to the rest of the stuff we do and tax preparation and tax advice is something that goes hand in hand with preparing the books. And it's something that 
who likes their tax accountant? Maybe one person listening to this podcast. <laughs> Everybody hates their tax accountant because they are generally not interesting people and they never get back to you and they, they're they slow and they don't get it done and they don't, whatever. Here's a shout out to Jeff. I actually love my tax account. He's very good. He gets back to you. Uh, but we need to figure some stuff out, I think. Get that guy some business. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm always looking to work with yeah. the Jeffs of the world because yeah. they're rare. Yeah. So I'm learning about tax. Um, one, to help our clients a little bit better, yeah. and then um, two, potentially add that as a, an important service. Right now, we do have tax service. We outsource it. Yeah. But we outsource it, and the service is okay. Yeah. I want people's service to be fantastic. I want them to be excited. Well, if it's part of month end, especially. Yeah. I mean, I could see how that dovetail. And you're trying to self-educate so you know enough so that whoever you hire, you can also make sure, like, hey, what's going on? You're speaking the same language. Well, do you want to you're be- You're not speaking Spanish at a Spanish interview. Right. Do you want to be led and managed by somebody who has no idea what they're talking about? Right. You don't. So I'm going to hire somebody to run it who's smarter than me, but I also want to be able to give them some you value know, and, feedback. Yeah, yeah. I love that. That's amazing. Do you have a favorite quote? I think I do. Um, Churchill, never, ever, ever, ever give up. So some of the themes have come through here, like yeah. grit, determination, yeah. Phil Knight. Um, and I tell my team this, like there's no, you can't, there's no such thing as not getting the right answer. You either continue to do it until you get the right answer or you die. Like <laughs> one of those things is going to come first. Um, and if you give up, there's just, it's not a, it's not, it's not ABC. Keep trying, die or give up. There's no C. You don't give up. And certain times you have to maybe take an alternative approach because there's this thing called time and you have to get stuff done. But giving up is not cool at right. month end. Right. He had some amazing quotes <laughs> in Churchill. That's probably one of his one of his more well-known ones. I like that one. Um, the one I'm thinking of is not appropriate for air. Um, <laughs> what's your superpower? I don't have one, man. Okay. I don't have a superpower. There's a couple things that I think I can do better than most. Mm -hmm. So and this is really boring. If you send me your financials, yeah. <laughs> I can tell you immediately the health of your company. I love that. And and I actually enjoy it. And I, I never I always thought accounting was the nerdiest thing ever. Like college finance folks, although it sounds kind of like accounting, finance folks are like offense and defense. If you play high school football, like and you you know, you're on offense, you think the defense guys are, you know, your buddies, but at the same time, you know, you give each other a little bit of crap. Mm -hmm. Um finance and accounting are like that. So if you go to a university and you have finance majors and accounting majors, you ask them what they think about each other, they're gonna give you a nasty answer. Right. So I never thought this would be something that'd be interesting to me, but actually if you really want to understand what's going on with a business, and it doesn't have to be a home building business, any business, if you have a really good solid foundation and fundamental understanding of financial statements, the balance sheet, which is the health of the company, and the P&L, which is the performance of the company, you can interpret in any industry what's going on, and you can give some at least general advice. Now, if you're a specialist in the industry, like we are with home building, you can give very specific tactical advice like hey i see your accounts receivable is continuing to go up month over month what are you doing for collection you're obviously not collecting from your clients fast enough assuming sales are flat why don't you use a tool like builder trend and use WePay so you can get digital payments people love paying online that's going to help speed up your collections right so those very specific tactical pieces of advice come from interpreting numbers on the financial statements and those just come out to me and, and like you are this phenomenal Spanish speaker, right? <laughs> so for most, si. yeah, see, for most people reading Spanish, they have, you know, like it's just letters on a page. But for you, who's this, you know, you could do a whole interview in Spanish. Um, <laughs> it means something to you. Mm -hmm. So when I look at a financial statement, I immediately just interpret it. Right. And um, that's probably almost any like good accountant. So it's not necessarily a superpower. I can also hit a golf ball really far. <laughs> but is it straight? Rarely. <laughs> uh, last question. What um, If you could start over, what, what would be some advice that you would tell yourself? I think the most important thing is to not be afraid to grow slow. When we first started out, we grew really fast and we managed it pretty well, but it, there were some, you know, fires. Like there were sacrifices that had to be made and a lot of it was, you know, like health and stress and employees being stressed and you know, we have a long time. Like we have plenty of time to get this done. So um, manage growth a little bit more carefully. We've managed to figure that out now. Um, and so if I was starting over again, that's that's what I would do. I did a couple things right because it was sort of my second act. 
right? Yeah. I had this corporate job, which is like, you know, the amuse-bouche. This is my mouth getting ready for business. And then I had the real estate gig, which is really the first act in my career. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so this first act I was able to learn from. And so the second act, I was able to make fewer mistakes, but you're always going to make mistakes, right? So um, don't be afraid to grow slow. And that's great for builders too. Builders that grow really fast never have any cash and they don't understand it. And they look at their profitability and they say, I'm super profitable. I'm growing fast. I have great jobs. My customers love me. I don't have any cash. I have zero cash. That's part of growth. You don't have cash when you're growing. When you're shrinking or staying flat. So if I don't have cash, that means I'm growing? That Maybe. isn't necessarily <laughs> what it means. Not having cash yeah. sometimes is the result of growth, yeah. but <laughs> there could be other reasons for it. Mark, we'll talk yeah. about that. <laughs> That's offline. Off- <laughs> we'll, we'll dive into that. I'm going to have to pay for those services. Um, well, thank you very much for coming on. We're out of time. Um, I think the things that we discussed is actually really, really helpful. I hope the people listening will, will find it uh equally helpful. If people want to find you, reach out to you. What are some of your social handles and where can they find you? Month End HQ um, on Instagram and Facebook and uh, www.monthend.com. All right. We'll have everything in the show notes as well. Thanks again for coming on, Chris. I really appreciate it. And uh, for those listening, uh, please uh, give us a five-star rating and review. And uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please share with uh, your friends and family. And uh, it really helps us grow and uh, get our message out there. And if you have any questions for Chris, uh, you know where to find him. Thanks again for listening into the Curious Builder podcast. 